Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you personally for braving our parking lot. Uh, if we could go back in time and design more than one entrance, uh, that would be nice. But I, I can't go time travel, and that's above my pay grade. So, um, But thank you. Uh, we're really glad to have you here on a Saturday morning. It's really encouraging to be able to see so many people come out to hear about uh, history on a Saturday. I mean, that's, you don't find this everywhere. So it's really fun to see everyone. Uh, before I go any further, I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Jacob Rohrm. I do public programs here at the History Center and for the Minnesota Historical Society. And it's my privilege to be able to bring so many wonderful programs and topics to our audiences. Uh, you know, and this one is no exception. I want to thank uh, Jim Stewart, who brought me uh, uh, Donald's book, Teaching White Supremacy, about a year ago, probably, and uh, kept pestering me <laughs> gently, but uh, to say how, you know, this would be a really great topic to bring to the MNH audience, and uh, we were trying to figure out a way for it to fit within our programming slate, and then we had a new exhibit on the uh, docket, uh, Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow. If you haven't had the chance to see it, it opened on February 3rd, and it documents the history of the sort of 50 years after the Civil War and the fight for civil rights, the fight for citizenship, the fight for equality in that period, including Reconstruction, the successes and failures of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, and the backlash against the extension of equality and citizenship to, to African Americans, and uh, the ways that African Americans continued to fight and persist despite that backlash. It's a really terrific exhibit. Um, it's upstairs in our museum. So even after this lecture, if you want to go take a look, stop by our ticket desk and grab a, a ticket to the museum or a membership, and then you can come back many times. Uh, we also have The Life and Art of Charles M. Schultz, which is about St. Paul's most famous cartoonist. It's running, both exhibits are running through June 9th, so you have a little bit of time to see them, but I would encourage you to check them out when you have the opportunity. We also have, as you probably saw there and in your program, we have great other programs coming up, including ones that have very uh, topical resonance with this one. Uh, I want to point out a couple. One is at the end of this month, March 30th, Robert G. Parkinson is going to be talking about his recent book, 13 Clocks, which is a, a quite a startling history, similar to this one where he uh, underwent a really rigorous research process where he read every single colonial newspaper in the five years leading up to the Declaration of Independence because he wanted to know what were the general public of the American colonies, what did they understand about this push for independence? How did patriot leaders motivate and get people to, to support that cause? How did they get 13 distinct and uh, colonies that didn't always like each other, didn't always get along, to join together. And the answer, one of the answers he found was quite disturbing. It was the ways that they used racial fear to motivate people. Uh, the fear of uh, enslaved Africans rebelling and the British encouraging that. The ways that uh, the British might ally with native nations against American colonists. So it's a really uh, important, adds a lot of extra uh, context to that history that we, we might know fairly well and really enriches our understanding of that time period of the, around the, the American independence. So I hope you can come back for that. Tickets for that are on sale. That one's part of our History Forum series. We also have one, another one in connection to our Black Citizenship exhibit at the end of April that's going to be on the history of the Green Book, which was uh, Victor Green's um, motorist uh, guidebook for African Americans to know how to safely navigate the United States in the age of Jim Crow and racial uh, segregation and, and beyond that too, um, up until the 60s. Uh, so we're gonna have a, we're gonna documentary film about that and then we have Nita Presley who's gonna be talking about uh, some of the local stops that were in the Green Book here in St. Paul. So please come back for that one. Um, I think that's about it for now. I wanna thank you for coming out. Please check our events page. We got lots of wonderful events coming up. Everything from concerts to lectures to films and everything in between. Um, but before uh, we do, also make sure noisemakers are off. I always think mine is off, and then occasionally I'm the person that forgets, so just check that. And I also want to introduce uh, one more person who's going to introduce our speaker, Donald, uh, and that's Yusef Mjani. Please give him a round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. 
We have a nice turnout today. Thank you for competing with the people at the uh, hockey games <laughs> for spaces in the parking lot. We appreciate that. Um, I am a member of a group, along with Jacob, with uh, Jim Stewart, Peter Ratchleff, uh, Clarence, Kevin Donovan, Earl Ross, and a number of others called Embracing Minnesota Histories. And we have been working with Donald on Zoom for several months. Uh, this is probably the eighth or ninth presentation that he has made this week while he's in town. He has been very generous with his time. And this is the, uh, the Keystone event. Um, I would like to try and introduce Donald correctly and accurately, and that is very difficult because um, a number of people have expressed some confusion and even some fear about the title of his book. Donald is a lifetime associate at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research and has written and edited nine books, including Teaching White Supremacy, the one that he is going to speak about this morning. He won an NAACP Image Award with Henry Louis Gates Jr. for the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. I'm uh, trusting that some of you have seen that or will take a look at it on PBS if you get the opportunity. It's an excellent documentary. He also is a recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal, uh, which is Harvard University's highest honor in African American research and studies. Donald spent years sifting through hundreds of textbooks from the colonial era down through the 20th century. And his book reveals how Northern publishers perpetuated the pernicious myth of white supremacy through the teaching of American history. His book marshals a wealth of evidence to show how racial bias has insidiously endured and inundated itself in our educational system, how it burrowed into the heart of our collective national identity, and why the topic of race in education is still hotly contested today. The book is an important reminder about the power of history in shaping our nation for better or worse. And as an example, in last Friday's San Diego Times, uh, an opinion piece read, this new book, Teaching White Supremacy by Donald Yakovon, details how history textbooks for most of the nation's past have perpetuated a sympathetic if not overtly white supremacist view of America's race relations. For most Americans, our high school American history course provided the one comprehensive whack we had at learning our nation's heritage. A free public reception will follow this morning's lecture in the Heffelfinger Room, and we will provide refreshments. We've got African coffee, African tea, lemonade, and water, <laughs> courtesy of uh, Rafiki Catering, and uh, we encourage you to, uh, to join us. And if you'd like to purchase a book and have Donald sign it for you, that would be the ideal opportunity to do so. Um, this presentation this morning is being recorded and will be available on the Minnesota History Center's YouTube channel. Please inform your friends and colleagues who are unable to join us today to check it out. And without any further ado, please join me in providing a warm welcome to Donald Yacobon. Uh, first of all, before I launch into this, um, I want to thank the Minnesota History Center for this opportunity. It's uh, extraordinary. In fact, it's <laughs> it's capstone of an extraordinary, sorry, the light's a little bit blind, blinding, um, extraordinary week for me. Um, and it has allowed me to uh, see parts of uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, but especially the people of Minneapolis-St. Paul who are just fabulous. And um, I thank you for their 
for the uh, hospitality uh, and the interest in this subject matter. I also want to um, make sure that I thank Yosef, uh, uh, Drs. James Brewer Stewart and Peter Ratcliffe, who've worked tirelessly to make this week of events possible. Without them, this would not have happened. Moreover, um, the organization that they started, Embracing Minnesota Histories, has dedicated itself to enacting, making real statement that Governor Waltz had made. The f In a recent State of the <coughs> State address, he said, and these are his words, not mine, the forces of hatred and bigotry are on the march in states across this country and around the world. But let me say it now, and let me state it clearly, that march stops at Minnesota's borders. Yeah. Because of the group I've been working with, Jim, especially, that may be a reality. They need help, and I hope you join with them. Also, before I launch into this, I want to issue a warning. Some of this language is tough to swallow. It's harsh. It's insulting. But that's the point. Confederate flags swayed during the January 6, 2021 assault on the United States Capitol building and American democracy. But such emblems can be diverting symbols, tempting viewers to shrug off racial oppression as something as extinct as the Confederacy and Southern slavery. Far from it. The gallows, with its wretched noose erected outside the Capitol, spoke louder. While many wistful Americans had hailed Barack Obama's 20, uh, 2008 election as the end of the ASEAN regime, almost an equal number woke up the following morning in shock. The election of an African-American president, twice no less, became the harbinger of profound change, one that jeopardized white American identity. The number of white Americans feeling overwhelmed disparaged and dispossessed, only increased with each passing day. As the New Yorker magazine writer and Harvard historian Jill Lepore observed in 2010, many whites felt the shocking sensation that Obama's election, and these are her words, had ripped a tear in the fabric of time. As if affirming Newton's third law of physics that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. National politics responded with the election of the great white demagogue. Anxious whites rose up in 2016 to elect someone who would re-empower them, even if only symbolically. As one commentator observed, white men in America believed, quote, that their voice was not being heard Trump gave them their voice back. As the past president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Sherilyn Eiffel proclaimed recently in the New York Review of Books, we are, and these are her words, in a moment of existential crisis. She recognized that in the most profound of ways, we are being driven to face hard truths about our republic about our political system, she said, about our neighbors, our safety, our understanding of who we are, about our past and our future. It is, I believe, a battle for American identity. As a nation, we are in the midst today of an identity crisis not seen since the immigration waves of the early 20th century. 
and one with all the ramifications of the 1860s. Why? The 1619 projects, Nicole Hannah-Jones recalled that, and these are her words, that the world revealed to me through my education was a white one. People of African descent did not matter. She had been taught that they were inconsequential at best, invisible at worst. If they appeared in all, at all in her textbooks, she remembered, it was only as slaves and disappeared until the rise of Martin Luther King Jr. We, she said, were not actors but acted upon. We are not contributors, just recipients. White people enslaved us. White people freed us. The great writer and social critic James Baldwin recalled in 1965 that he had been taught that, again, these are his words, Africa had no history, and that neither had I. I was a savage about whom the, la the least said the better, who had been saved by Europe and who had been brought to America. Of course, this was an act of God, he said. You belong where white people put you, he wrote. 160 years of struggle against this fabricated version of national identity had begun to bear fruit when, in, in 2016, the delayed response came, and with a fury. What Obama represented, embodied, could not be tolerated. Accepted understanding of what constituted true American identity was at stake. The tear in the fabric of time had to be erased. As Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin recorded in his recent memoir, a significant minority of Americans, quote, refused to accept the end to white supremacy and is mobilizing political lies and racial grievances to resist any fulfillment of cultural democracy. What analysts had denounced as the big lie, quote unquote, Raskin rightly equated to the lost cause, the mythology of the post-Reconstruction era, which aimed to, def <coughs> excuse me, to defeat equal rights for African Americans and give to the South a victory in peace that it had lost in war. James Baldwin's observations of 1963 remain as true now as in his lifetime. Such Americans, quote, are in effect still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. Creating such an understanding is the challenge. But Baldwin identified the central issue at stake in our ongoing American crisis. The danger, he wrote, in the minds of most Americans is the loss of their identity. They understand this as an assault on one's own reality. This is exactly what motivates those like the 19-year-old white supremacist who murdered 10 African Americans in a Buffalo supermarket. As the Boston Globe had reported, the white adolescent had become obsessed with preserving, quote, white power in the US. This image, this 1873 lithograph, variously titled Manifest Destiny or American Progress, by the New York publisher and Western travel promoter George A. Crawford, exalts the divine mission of the United States to expand across the continent. The illustration's alluring figure of Columbia with the star of empire on her forehead floats across the landscape, sweeping away indigenous peoples and the wilderness for the expansion of American farms, cities, and railroads. Her left hand clutches a telegraph line, the internet of the 19th century. And her right hand cradles, not the Bible, which I thought it was at first, or a digest of laws. But as Crawford himself wrote, the emblem of education, the school book, and I, you probably can't read it, 
But right there, it actually says school book right on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was shocked when I discovered that. Never before or since has any American more graphically unified national identity with white supremacy and education, illustrating a cherished mythical past that is now rapidly disappearing, leaving behind the psychic crisis. Now, just to uh, make sure you understand that I'm not a closet Marxist, unless we're talking about Groucho, <laughs> I did not just set out to write Teaching White Supremacy. I had been deep, and I mean deep, into research for an entirely different book. But my encounter with this, this astounding collection of 3,000 history textbooks at the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Monroe C. Gutman Library compelled me to change. And it threw me into the unknown. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew I had to do it, whatever that was. Honestly, I just had no idea where that collection was going to take me. The unexpected result is not a book about a bunch of bad books, but an exploration of the origins, development, and perpetuation of the idea of American national identity as white from the colonial period to today. If nothing else, it focused on the responsibility of northern cultural leaders and educators for the creation and dissemination of white supremacy and construction of the so-called color line. Traditionally, both scholarship and popular thought have blamed the legacy of Southern slavery and Jim Crow for the persistence of racial, so-called racial inequality. And of course, Southern slave owners and their descendants do possess a unique and lethal responsibility for civil war and racial, what we call racial repression. But even if slaves had never existed in the South, Northern religious leaders, intellectuals, writers, politicians, scientists, educators, and lawyers would have invented a lesser race, which is exactly what happened, to build white democratic solidarity and in that way make democratic culture and political institutions possible. As the novelist Toni Morrison once explained, in the United States, the rights of man was inevitably yoked to Africanism. Those are her words. In other words, American democracy depended upon black inequality to sustain white equality. Responsibility for this consciousness of exclusion, this enduring identity of true Americans as only descendants of Europeans rest broadly and profoundly in our history. The principles of white supremacy have been central to the American experience, predating creation of the American Republic and whatever commitment to democratic republicanism that later emerged. I want to point out Samuel Sewell, the legendary 17th century judge of the Salem witchcraft trials. He expressed how later Americans would come to understand our national identity. Early American settlers and their descendants conceived of the new communities as special, in the colonial era, as special divinely inspired creations of Europeans for Europeans and their descendants. The people of African descent who lived and moved among them, uh, not even considering the Native Americans, who lived, who of course were here first, especially in New England, would always be outsiders, foreign objects, no matter how respected, even admired, some people of African descent might be, as Sewell noted in his own famous diary, they would always remain separate, distinct, and outside the mainstreams of American life. Now, Sewell's also remembered, often less um, popularly, but I think more significantly, as the author of the 1700 
uh, selling of Joseph, the first anti-slavery pamphlet in American history, 1700. And he, in many ways, is symbolic of the problem. He went on, he denounced slavery as an unchristian scourge. He reminded New Englanders that, quote, he hath made of one blood all nations of men. Sounds good. Yet, Sewell, anticipating in many ways the ugly side of 19th century anti-slavery thought, also explained that African Americans, and these are his words, still remain in our body politic as a kind of extravasant blood, unquote. They existed outside the regular veins and capillaries of the body politic. Despite his abolitionism, which was unwavering, the African presence, the mere presence of people of African descent raised such fearsome concerns for him that it made him wonder, and these are his words, whether he would retain his cherished whiteness, quote, after the resurrection, unquote. This assertion of a people who exist outside of American identity, beyond white consciousness, set the pattern that would remain with us to this day. During the mid to late 19th century, few people possessed the power, determination, and influence of John H. Van Every. Someone you undoubtedly never heard of. the nation's first professional racist. And I mean that. He made his living being a racist, and he was, made a lot of money doing it. As the spindle upon which the pre- and post-Civil War eras swirled, he worked feverishly to bind, to permanently bind, white supremacy to the nation's democratic ethos. The, mo the North's most belligerent enemy of Reconstruction Van Every employed his unprecedented genius, and it was an unprecedented genius for marketing, to inject white supremacist ideals into American political discourse and identity throughout the North and South. Smart, ambitious, and blessed with boundless energy, Van Every fused an unprecedented marketing campaign to an exhaustive command of the works of ethnologists like Harvard's Louis Agassiz bolstered white supremacist foundations of the Democratic Party, capital D, and the white working class. Best known for his repellent books, Negroes and Negro Slavery, Free Negroism, Subgenation, a word he made up, and White Supremacy and Negro Subordination, Van Every ran a small publishing empire, Van Every Horton and Company, right in the heart of Manhattan the seat of American economic and political power. Van Every's firm circulated a flood of similarly themed pamphlets, texts, and even a novel. He also published two combative newspapers. One of them, the New York Day Book, became the weekly Caucasian in 1861 after the Lincoln administration tried to shut down papers that they thought promoted disloyalty and treason. They couldn't shut him up. Van Every popularized the terms white supremacy and master race has been either overlooked or grossly underestimated by most modern historians and, of course, remains virtually unknown otherwise. A toxic combination of Joseph Goebbels, Steve Bannon, and Rupert Murdoch, Van Every spread his influence across the country and into Europe. Nearly all Democrats, nearly all Democrats of the mid-19th century knew of him, and even Abraham Lincoln had read some of his works. Immediately after the Civil War, Van Every and his business partner, Rushmore G. Horton, sought to shape public, future public consciousness of the past with their raucous history textbook, A Youth, Youth's History of the Great Civil War in the United States. This is one illustration from that book. And what's going on there uh, to sustain his interpretation of African Americans um, and uh, 
the conflict. These are Union soldiers forcing former slaves off the plantation because according to him, they refused to leave because they loved being slaves. They had to be forced out by bayonet point. And his book was used in Boston. The influential head of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Mildred Lucy Rutherford, for instance, also reprinted Van Every's book and employed its conclusions to, de, to, do, uh, to defend the South, secession, and slavery. And it remains a staple on white supremacist websites today. I looked and checked. We have undervalued Van Every's impact, ignored his poisonous writings, and failed to understand how much he helped shape modern white supremacist ideology, even in the South. His venomous views played an enormous role in the assault on what we now consider to be our modern understanding of liberty and civil rights that struggled to emerge after the Civil War. Ignoring him, we have completely underestimated the intensity of Northern white supremacy before and after the war. Nearly all the textbooks I read, and I went through the entire collection of 3,000, I had, uh, <clears throat> They had almost, none of them had any connection to a Southern segregationist press, and certainly not to the Klan or any other far-right publisher. In fact, those publishers didn't emerge in the South until the 1920s. These textbooks formed a central thread, a kind of spinal cord of American memory and aspirations over the course of two centuries of our existence. Moreover, the thousands of textbooks that have stained the minds of generations of students from the, uh, from the elementary grades to college were pro produced almost entirely by northern publishing houses, Boston, New York, Chicago, and crafted by northern trained scholars and education specialists. Indeed, several of the most famous and influential historians of the first half of the 20th century nearly all trained at northern colleges and universities, produced some of the most repugnant texts I had the displeasure to read. Despite my familiarity with the historiography of slavery and race, this vast cache of textbooks that I ran into, because of their enormous educational and societal roles, forced me to rethink the trajectory of American history and culture. And for most of them, there was nothing subtle about the approach. One 1930 text, for instance, began on the very first page, very first page, capital letters, with a screaming headline, quote, the story of the white man, unquote. Only English-speaking people created America, they said. As one 1918 school book proclaimed, the forces that have shaped that life have been English, unquote. We possessed a fixed identity, one inherited exclusively from Great Britain. Ralph Waldo Emerson had long before worshiped that view with his 1856 book, it's not a textbook, English Traits. Merging physiognomy, morals, and ethics as only Emerson could do, he explained that the English face combined decision and nerve with a fair complexion, blue eyes and florid, open florid aspect. Hence the love of truth. <laughs> Hence the sensibility, the fine perception and poetic construction. For Emerson, and these are his words, race was the controlling influence. And in the Negro, he declared, it is of appalling importance. He clearly disdained slavery, there's no question about it, but bemoaned the common moral failings of a white person more than anything else, especially far more than, quote, the captivity of a thousand Negroes, which is nothing to me. Ralph Waldo Emerson. A Child's History of the United States came out in 1856 
insisted that early U.S. history was the record of the white man's progress over the godless red savage, and most books use that phrase. Across two centuries, and with precious few exceptions, African Americans in these textbooks, if they appeared at all, were only a problem, only as a problem, only as, quote, ignorant Negroes, unquote, for the real subjects of this written history were, of course, people of European descent. As one 1914 school book typically asserted, the black man, quote, became a problem that it took many years to solve, unquote. The assumptions of white identity, white domination, and white importance underlie every chapter and every theme of the thousands of textbooks that blanketed the schools of our country. This vast tectonic plate still underlies American culture and must be the concern for every one of us. And while the very worst features of our textbook legacy may have ended, the themes, facts, and attitudes, as you'll see, of supremacist ideologies are deeply embedded in our national identity, in what we teach and how we teach it. Such has always been the case. Noah Webster's 1832 History of the United States proved distressingly typical of U.S. history textbooks published before the Civil War. The Connecticut-born Webster of dictionary fame, his house still stands in West Hartford, cared nothing for the history of slavery or African Americans. Recalling James Baldwin's opening words, I would remark, Webster wrote elsewhere, not in the textbook, that of woolly-haired Africans who constitute the principal part of the inhabitants of Africa, there is no history, and there can be none. That race has remained in barbarism from the first ages of the world. Their country has never been explored very fully by civilized man. For Webster, Puritans, especially Connecticut Puritans, were the country's founding fathers, the real founding fathers. His book only made passing mention of settlements below Mason-Dixon and completely ignored the rise of slavery. American history for Webster was the record of his, pure, his Puritan forebearers and no others. Thus, for two centuries, the standard of whiteness in history had been set. Much to my astonishment, no American history textbook before 1860 ever mentioned the name of an abolitionist or the existence of an anti-slavery movement. Given how the Compromise of 1850 rocked the country and bonded abolitionism to free speech and basic constitutional rights, this fact just floored me. If slavery is mentioned at all, the discussion focused on Congress and political leaders like Henry Clay or Daniel Webster. History for this generation of textbook authors took place only in European colonization I, European exploration, European colonization, the revolution, constitution forming, and then every successive presidential administration with every paragraph numbered and nowhere else. In these books, the layout, appearance, and order of events was the same. And this model persisted into the 20th century from a reader's perspective, this approach proved onerous at times. William Swinton's 1872 First Lessons in Our Country's History, aiming to combine simplicity with sense, clearly proved intolerable to stu one student who stabbed the copy I read at the Gutman Library <laughs> with a sharp implement right through the back cover and halfway through the book. <laughs> it was a pleasure seeing that, I'll tell you. <laughs> the Connecticut-born Samuel Griswold Goodrich, who gained fame as Peter Parley, claimed to have published 170 different books selling 7 million copies. This is before the Civil War. His enormously popular Pictorial History of the United States, which first came out in 1843, sold 500,000 copies. Who wouldn't lust for that? The 1866 edition published after his death 
simply tacked on a new chapter about the Civil War to the old edition, but somehow forgot to mention the end of slavery. His brother, Charles A. Goodrich, gave up the ministry to become a textbook author because his brother was so successful. Well, his text did disapprove, especially the um, post-Civil War edition of it, disapproved of slavery. It never mentioned any abolitionists except John Brown, who he said was insane. The book lacked any coherent discussion of even the beginnings of Reconstruction. Thus, for both the Goodrich brothers, black lives do not matter. There are several important exceptions to this pattern of white supremacy in educational texts that appeared after the Civil War, uh, shaped by the anti-slavery movement and, of course, by radical Reconstruction. But most textbooks published after the 1880s and for almost the entire 20th century proved far more overtly white supremacist than those that came before. Further time we go into the future, the more aggressive they are. Even authors, especially authors, who viewed uh, sympathetically the anti-slavery movement and even treated John Brown dispassionately revealed their true prejudices when dealing with the history of Reconstruction. This was so predictable. Inevitably, the worst chapter of almost every textbook published before the mid-1960s, most of them rendered Reconstruction parroting the works of men like Claude Bowers, George Fort Milton, James Tuzlo Adams, and of course, the two famous uh, Columbia University scholars, John W. Burgess and especially William A. Dunning. Dunning, more than anyone, succeeded in having the country define Reconstruction, quote, as a synonym for bad government, unquote. He and other Northern scholars made sure that Americans understood Reconstruction as the period when, and again, his words, Negroes exercised an influence in political affairs out of all relation to their intelligence or property, even in proportion to their numbers. Yeah, textbooks. Nauseatingly and relentlessly, these texts repeated the phrase ignorant Negroes to describe the freed people who struggled to find a future amid the embattled landscape and intractable resistance of Southern whites. Indeed, reading our textbook history of Reconstruction from 1900 until the mid-1960s is a shocking immersion in historical distortion, white arrogance and racial domination, black incapacity, and nostalgia for those sweet days of slavery. How sweet? Arthur C. Perry and Gertrude A. Price's 1914 book, his, uh, textbook, American History, was a two-volume grammar school text. They explained uh, the life of slaves by employing this color image of gleeful, quote, Negroes at their cabin door after a day's work getting together for a rollicking time. They presented slavery as a kind of summer camp where people of African descent, they, they weren't from Florida, uh, lived easy, careless, easygoing lives. They were a childlike people, they wrote, with no sense of responsibility, from the little pickaninnies to the oldest aunties and mammies. The authors wrote that slaves lived contented lives and, quote, were better off than they would have been if free to shift for themselves. Typical of this pattern, Perry and Price were Northerners, in this case, New Yorkers, not Southerners, the latter a PhD superintendent of schools and the former a New York City public school teacher. Fremont P. Worth's Development of America now his textbook included this image of ecstatic slaves. The Illinois-born Worth had received his PhD from the University of Chicago and then became a professor at the famed Peabody College for teachers in Nashville. And his book, first published in 1937, was reprinted throughout the 1950s. Similarly, Thomas Marshall's 1930 textbook 
had riveted in the student's mind Van Every's notion that people of African descent were best suited for and thrived in the South's labor system, overseen by the very kindness of masters. The Negro of plantation days, he wrote, was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others and liked to sing, dance, crack jokes, like these guys. He admired the bright colors and was proud to wear a red or yellow bandana. He was never in a hurry. He was always ready to let things go until the morrow. Most of the planters learned that not the whip, but loyalty based on pride, kindness, and rewards brought the best results. Textbooks written by Southerners certainly existed. The first perhaps in 1850 and others much later, several authored by women. If a southern school district wished to avoid the influence of Yankeeism, they could assign one of many published state histories. In South Carolina, for instance, a teacher could assign uh, one state his history authored by the uh, very famous southern novelist William Gilmore Sims. Sims. Originally published in Charleston in 1840 and very successful, his book remained in print through 1937. And after 1842, almost all of them were printed in New York. And why not? The Northern Press had the resources, the distribution networks that the few, the very few Southern press, presses that existed simply didn't have. State Southern, Southern state histories, following in the wake of Van Every, depicted the introduction of African slavery in the Western Hemisphere, quote, as an act of humanity to relieve Native Americans from onerous labor, especially in South American mines. The appropriately named Henry Alexander White made sure that students who read his 1906 textbook understood that in South Carolina, quote, Negroes worked the rice fields because they could labor without injury to themselves and whites couldn't. Many baby boomers who lived in Virginia and its suburbs of the nation's capital likely saw very few U.S. history textbooks. Instead, they received their education from state histories such as the 1957 Virginia History, Government, and Geography, guaranteed to conform to white standards by the state's, quote, History and Government Textbook Commission, the volume closely followed Jim Crow and Van Every versions of slavery in the past. Slavery, the book's three authors asserted, proved a great benefit for whites and a godsend for blacks. An illiterate people, they wrote, who, 1957, knew nothing of Christianity or civilization and learned both as slaves and adapted easily to Virginia work and climate. I think the Florida governor read that book. <laughs> In this way, the authors wrote, Negroes played an important part of the development of Virginia. Just as Van Every had asserted, the text described Negroes as, quote, the best answer to the need for labor in the Tidewater. The slave trade, which did enrich Yankees, represented no burden to Africans who arrived on specially, this is fabulous, specially designed ships with many little cubby holes or in cells to stay in during their long voyage to America. They have pictures, they have illustrations of these fabulously dressed people of African descent talking to the ship owners uh, to illustrate how comfortable they were coming over to the New World. I would have included it in the book, but there are copyright issues, so I couldn't. <clears throat> no mention had been made of the 2.5 million Africans who died during the horrific Middle Passage to the Western Hemisphere. Their labors in Virginia did not hurt them, the authors wrote and Africans benefited enormously from enslavement by learning trades and enjoying the work and play of plantations. In his new home, the Negro was far away from the 
spears and war clubs of enemy tribes. And he had better food, a better house, and better medical care than he would have had in Africa. More importantly, he was conf comforted, comforted by a religion of love and mercy. These authors held up George Washington as a standard of Virginia slave masters, an owner who offered his human property, quote, sweetened tea, broth, and sometimes a little wine. More moreover, masters proved wise leaders, they taught, who never harshly punished slaves and only occasionally whipped them much in the way an adult would whip a child. But the most damaging volumes were written by Northerners. Gertrude and John Southworth, two Indiana teachers, one a junior high school, I'm sorry, a junior college professor, and the other a prep school teacher, published The Story of Our America, a text that spoke openly about our America and left no question as to whom they referred. The text adopted by the state of Indiana for the seventh and eighth grades built upon decades of scholarship scorning Reconstruction. The Southworth used this image of galloping Klansmen lifted directly from Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, to illustrate how the Klan and similar groups heroically defeated corrupt carpetbag and scalawag governments and their Negro tools to restore respectable whites to their justly dominant position. And this book was reprinted throughout the 1950s. The depth and range of white supremacy and the damaging spell it casts today can be seen in the rage against immigrants. John J. Chapman, reformer, author, scholar, public intellectual, and graduate of Harvard University and Law School, notice the Harvard theme here, <laughs> possessed the deepest abolitionist roots. His grandmother was the famed Boston abolitionist Maria Weston Chapman, and he knew her. In 1918, as the public repudiation of the anti-slavery movement sunk to new depths, he instead went in the opposite direction and published a brilliant study of William Lloyd Garrison and never, ab never abandoned his commitment to African Americans. Never. But neither did he disavow the idea of Anglo-Saxonism that underpinned the white supremacy he had ironically censored at Harvard. Writing in 1917 to Theodore Roosevelt, Chapman began denouncing the Catholic Church as a, quote, political machine that threatened domination of the United States. <laughs> Do you see what's going on here in this image? The American River Ganges is the title. I've shown this uh, once before uh, at a uh, lecture I gave at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and folks couldn't quite figure out what was going on. These aren't alligators. These are Catholic bishops <laughs> coming ashore in New York to seize control of children and their education. His anti-Catholicism emerged with anti-Semitism in the fall of 1920. Chapman swallowed Henry Ford's vile accusations in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, and in, and in the book, The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem, uh, yes, a book which promoted the pre-war Russian forging of the Protocols of Elders of, uh, Elders of Zion, sorry. Ford's, uh, Henry Ford's revolting anti-Semitic campaign drenched the country with his newspaper reaching a circulation of 300,000. And the book with the Protocols of Elders of Zion, Zion sold half a million copies. That so sophisticated an author, an intellectual, and civil rights advocate, like Chapman, could swallow such vile poison only points to the intensity 
of the psychic crisis, as today, that was gripping white America who perceived the nation's Protestant Anglo-Saxon foundation as crumbling, especially in the 1920s. Nor did Chapman's anti-Semitism emerge from ignorance of or isolation from Jewish Americans. He had known and worked with Jewish New Yorkers since his very early days of uh, late 19th, early 20th century in the Bowery in New York, where he taught Jewish children. He worked with Jewish actors who performed his plays. Nevertheless, with each passing year, Chapman became increasingly fearful of what he imagined as the spreading influence and control of a Catholic Jewish conspiracy. The Jews are pushing a world movement, he wrote. One cannot doubt that it is controlled from a center, that it's designed to rule the world as far as possible by a clique. From the U.S. Supreme Court, where Louis Brandeis began serving in 1916, to the Viceroy of India, to the Holy Lands and Russia, they're all in a ring, Chapman exclaimed. In 1924, he warned the, author, the editor of the, of the Outlook magazine that, quote, events in the great world are flopping in a cataclysmic way. The machine of the Roman church is in control of the Jews. With such power, the church could claim a monopoly on education. See what's going on there. And impose her system on all humanity. I never heard of anyone who doubts that, he said. If, if Americans could not rely on Henry Ford, Chapman astonishingly declared, real Americans could fall back on the Ku Klux Klan. He even, Chapman, the hero, risked his life for African Americans, published his views in the Klan's newspaper, The National Courier. And this by a man who had risked his life in 1911 to protest the incineration of a lynching in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. David Saville Muzzy embodies northern influence in the teaching of history. Born into a prominent Lexington, Massachusetts family that stretches back to the 17th century, Muzzy graduated from Harvard in 1893 and studied at New York's Union Theological Seminary. He also studied at the University of Berlin, the Sorbonne, and even earned a PhD at Columbia University. His textbook, first published in 1911, was used for the next 50 years. I even had it in high school. Now, Muzzy is sort of typical. He condemned slavery, but when it came to Reconstruction, the empowering of African Americans was a, was a crime. As for Native Americans, Muzzy always referred to them as savages who reached the stage of lower barbarism, much like he wrote, the Mississippi Negro of today. This process of crafting this book also proved unexpectedly personal for me. I found at the Gutman Library the 1962 copy of Exploring the New World, which I had in my fifth grade social studies class in Saratoga, California. Exploring the New World never mentioned the anti-slavery movement. Slaves, on the other hand, proved necessary to pick cotton. Who else would do the work, they said. They didn't entirely approve of slavery. But they sought to um, build national unity during the Cold War just as uh, after the end of Reconstruction, authors tried to build national unity. And in doing so, exploring the new world said that everyone in the Civil War was brave, everyone fought for principle, everyone white, of course, and General Robert E. Lee represented all that is noble, gallant, and heroic in American society. His name is now loved and respected in both the North and South. 
we know that he was not only a gallant Southern hero, but a great American. The burning, well, the, much of this is now gone. Almost all of that is now gone in the modern textbooks. However, the problem remains. The influential New York Times journalist Charles Blow, born in 1970, explained that when he was young, I was led to believe blackness was inferior. We have been trained in it, bathed in it, acculturated to hate ourselves. At every turn, at every moment, I was being baptized in the narrative that everything white was right, good, noble, and beautiful, and everything black was not. The bitter influence lay everywhere, he wrote, even in the blue-eyed white Jesus hanging over your bed. The experience of black high school students in my own community outside of Boston four years ago only, inf only uh, sustained Blow's account. A local branch of the NAA NAACP, along with students, protested school curriculum and the punishments handed out to black students. I am not going to lie, one young woman exclaimed during the protest. Going to high school made me hate being black. There are, across the country, from Vermont to California, classrooms that hold slave auctions. Teachers have no training in the history of the United States, many of them being gym teachers. Censorship now is common. Texas and Florida, the modern center of repression and censorship, have banned about 800 books on slavery, race, sexuality, abortion, and a host of related issues, even the work of Henry Louis Gates, Jr. In the New York Times in 2020, they reported that medical students and residents in a Duke University survey remain convinced that African Americans have thicker skin and less sensitive nerve endings endings than whites. Amy Wax, a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania, very recently declared that, quote, on average, blacks have lower cognitive ability than whites. This was just a few months ago. She even advised a black law school student that the only reason she was able to attend Ivy League schools was because of affirmative action. And if such people continue in American education, that statement will be distressingly true. Finally, in May 2019, when a large group of African American seventh graders visited the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, terrific museum, staff had informed them that in the museum, they could have no food, no water, and no watermelon. Despite the monumental outburst of thoughtful and determined scholarship since the mid-1960s, the way we teach history in our public schools remains as lifeless as John Brown's body. Clearly, slavery and race, as the Ohio University scholar Hassan Kwame Jeffries observed, isn't in the past, it's in the headlines. However taught in schools, however, history is far from a dead thing. We carry it with us, James Baldwin memorably remarked in his essay, The White Man's Guilt. We are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, he said, since it is to history that we owe our frame of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. Thank you. I'll start, I'll start crying if you don't stop.
We have time for a couple audience questions, and then again, I want to just reiterate, please join uh, Dr. Yakovone and, and uh, the rest of us up in uh, across the rotunda, Heffelfinger Room, just for some refreshments and for some conversation. And free, I'm reminding everyone. So if you need a cup of coffee after this, free. Uh, but raise your hand if you have a, a question. I can't get to everything, but we'll try to get a couple in. Uh, I'll run a mic to you. So we got, this was the first one I saw. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, we appreciate it from all of us, especially Minneapolis Public Schools oh, educators. Um, as we continue to see the attack on critical race theory, um, which none of them can actually define, right. um, and the attack on public education, um, as, as a trans Latina native educator, um, we are constantly seeing attacks um, for, for all of us in education. And so I'm curious, as community members, what have you seen across the nation that community members can do to support and continue to push our educators that are teaching history that you're explaining? Yeah, um, I, the, the, this, this question or version of life, it always comes up, of course. Uh, it's the obvious question. And uh, unfortunately, there, there isn't one act, but it takes um, activities like this, it takes organization, and it takes resistance, and it, we cannot remain silent. We simply cannot remain silent. We have to. We, we have to oppose what we hear from people like uh, the governor of Florida. It's just, it's, it's, it's incendiary. It, 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 a lot of the language comes right out of the 1920s, especially fear of immigrants. Uh, and it's all being used to reinforce people, uh, the, the power of people of European descent in this country. Um, I would say join with <laughs> uh, embracing Minnesota histories, form your own organizations. Um, we cannot be silent. Silence means we are giving up the terrain to the forces of domination. Yeah. Next question. I, I wish I had a better answer, but I'm afraid there isn't one. Hi, um, my name is Araya. Um, I'm a student in college. And I just want to say that um, I really liked what you talked about today because I feel like it's really important for all of us in here to be in conversations like this because these are conversations that are not being had at all, especially as it pertains to teaching stuff like this. And it continues to be perpetuated. Um, so I just wanted to like ask, I guess, because I don't think, I'm not saying I don't think, but <laughs> how do you think that, I guess, teachers going forward right now can, um, I guess, be there better for their students as to, like, you know, so they're not necessarily keeping these things perpetuated and they're acting with compassion towards their students as well? Um, like especially towards the black and brown students. Cause I also like, I'm not a teacher, but I volunteer with kids in the schools. Cause you know, I just, that's just me. But um, I feel like there's a lot of places where I feel like I see teachers are not necessarily hitting with their BIPOC students. And it really breaks my heart. Cause I don't like to see stuff like that. And yep. a lot of the language that you've talked about, I feel like can still be used. And especially here in Minnesota, um, mm -hmm. Yes. Because a lot of the culture up here, I'm not going to lie, is really passive aggressive and, you know, it's just not. <laughs> but. Well, uh, well, look, uh, a, a, ma a major part of the problem uh, is the fact that uh, m many of the teachers responsible for teaching this subject, particularly uh, minority history, ethnicity, uh, have no training. They have absolutely no training. And that's part of the mission of embracing uh, Minnesota History's project is to offer that training to, to, uh, to teachers in the state of Minnesota as an example for the rest of the nation to follow. We, we, we here can set that precedent. And, and it's state law, only it's unfunded state law. 
But this, this is a national problem. This is not a local problem. It is a national problem. Uh, it, when I w was doing the book, and I discussed this in, in the latter chapter uh, of, of the end of the book, uh, so many of the teachers, even when I was in, in high school, uh, who were responsible for teaching uh, hi history was the gym teacher. I, 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 when I was in college, I was um, there to become a teacher, a high school teacher. I did student teaching. I got to tell you, and I opened the book with a story about my experience student teaching. It was horrific. I mean, imagine the first time going into the teacher's lounge, okay? <laughs> uh, it was mostly empty. It was a, there was an old, uh, on the, uh, this is a long time, 1974, okay? Uh, old linoleum floor. There were creaky old wooden chairs all around <laughs> the, uh, the four walls. There were very few people in there, but right in the middle of the room with an wo old wooden armchair was this old frazzled frizzy teacher, black, dark, really black rimmed glasses, sitting, sitting there gesticulating wildly about the white man's burden. I decided then and there that teaching was not, high school teaching was not gonna be in my future. Um, thank you for your presentation. Could you comment on how people can approach white defensiveness? Uh, uh, sorry. What, how, how to approach white people's defensiveness? about their supremacy, like how can, how can people listen to, you know, uh, and acknowledge the history and, and it seems like we're just not embracing diversity anymore, we're polarizing. <laughs> you think? Well, yeah. <laughs> but I, I just was wondering if you had any tactics for well, Yeah, well look, um, when I finished this book, uh, it became clear to me that it explores the true depths of the problem we are facing. And I think that without reading this book, you really can't understand what we're up against. I know that sounds like something to sell books, but, <laughs> right. but, I would, but if it were someone else's book, I'd say the same thing. And I think unless we comprehend what we are up against, how the, the people who refuse to accept diversity see themselves, their communities, their world, the nation, as a white one uh, that's, you know, binary, if that's the right term, uh, and not fueled by immigrants, even though a lot of these people are the children of immigrants, uh, we will never succeed. We first have to understand the true depths of what we are up against. And we are up against a psychic crisis of people who understand that people of European descent are becoming one more minority group in the United States. I mean, that's a fact. That is a true fact. They will soon be just one more group amid a large group of many different kinds of ethnicities. That excites me. I, that's like a world that's really pretty interesting. <laughs> I, I remember when, when I, um, I won't say what organization it was because Jim will get upset, but, <laughs> but when I attended one of my first uh, meetings of a, of a professional uh, history organization, I, and I, at the time I was living in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, I was with the Black Abolitionist Papers Project, and we were in a school, and we happened to have part of the meeting in the gym with, you know, because there are lots of places to sit, uh, you know, uh, bleachers. And I remember being at the end, and I looked over, and I looked, I said, holy shit, everybody here is white. This is like a white council meeting. How did that happen? Because, you know, Tallahassee had, was integrated. There are lots of people of African descent there. Um, we are up against a huge burden. And uh, there isn't, again, one method, one approach, uh, but 
we first have to understand what we are up against. And it doesn't get any more profound than that. I mean, look, I, I, I examined in the latter part of the book um, Boston and particularly Chicago. People, white families in Chicago are so outraged by having to send their children to integrated public schools that they take them out of the schools and put, they would rather pay taxes to support schools and pay tuition at private schools than allow their students to be in the same building with an African American. And as I found out, white parents in Chicago refuse to send their students to a school named for Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, that's what we're up against. I know there is a lot of questions in the room, but I do want to be respectful of folks' time. And I would encourage you to bring those questions to Dr. Yakovon yourself upstairs. Uh, I want to be just let him get upstairs to the table so that everyone has an equal opportunity to, to ask him questions. Don't trap him down here. Uh, and again, uh, join us across the rotunda. And uh, also, I just want to reiterate, you know, the Minnesota Historical Society, our, our mission is to serve all Minnesotans. We believe our collective history includes everyone's history. And we're really happy to be uh, part of this conversation and we want to continue that. So uh, please check out what we have coming up. Please buy Dr. Yagaman's book. I won't, we don't have enough copies for everyone. <laughs> so if you didn't get one here and you still want one, I would encourage you to find your local bookshop. They don't have it, ask them to order it in. So, uh, another round of applause, please. <laughs>